Hi guys, it is a very sunny day here in Perth, Western Australia and it's Bonnie here. Welcome back to my channel, Bonnie Prudanovic, Bonnie Productive Old Channel. And um, thumbs up this video if you enjoy it. In this video you will see me at a local camp which was organized by a mental health disability support agency called the Larry Kid Center and they're in West Leadville. They used to go out to camps once a year but this time they've done just daily activities. I've had drumming on Tuesday, that was the most fun. I wasn't able to do a video because uh, I was too busy in there but I've done a video of myself for archering of a river cruise and of uh, sandboarding and a little bit of chasing the ducks. So enjoy this video and don't forget to thumbs up thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Love from Bonnie. <laughs> Hello. This is Barney and welcome back to my channel. <laughs> I'm at the archery. I'll show you around. So I'm wearing tongs, which is not allowed. So for safety, we've got two shoe we've got two lines, okay? This front line, which is gone. <laughs> Swiggly for some reason. We call that the shooting line, okay? You're only standing on that line when you shoot. At any other time, you stand behind the waiting line, which is that far behind line. Can I be safety-wise, go over here, take a photo, which I'll never go over there again while they're shooting? Um, no. Okay. When they're not shooting, well, yeah. The yeah, now, now, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah now, fine. while they're all standing there, ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, mm. We're going to be calling I'm incognito whistles. with my glasses <laughs> on. So this is a big whistle, so when I do two, Two whistles means standing on the shooting line, and then one whistle means you can shoot, okay? Okay. So, when you're shooting the bow, when I blow the two whistles, if you want to head over here so you can see, I'm just going to show you how to do it. So, just in front, you can come over, just head in front. Huddle. Yeah, just kind of huddle, because you've got to be standing in front of me. Because I'm going to use this bow to show you how to shoot. Okay? So when you shoot, what you want is one foot over, one foot behind, okay? Mm -hmm. You can pick up the bow, and when I give you your arrows, your arrows are going to have two colours. One with one fletch, and then two. So in my case, I got one white, and two black. So I want the black, the white fletch to face towards me like this. So not like that, like this. Okay. So when I put the arrow on, you want to hear this sound. Everyone hear that? Yeah. yeah. That means it's on properly. Okay? okay? When you shoot, this is the handle. You want to put your hand just like that. And you want three fingers. Your top finger goes on top, mm -hmm. two underneath, okay? Good. Like that. So when you shoot, your arm forward, and then you bring it back to your cheek. So you want to touch your cheek like this, okay? Yeah. With your hand. With your hand, when you pull it back, you want okay. to touch your cheek. Mm. So arm out straight, touch your cheek. Oh. Oh. You just let it roll off your fingers, okay? okay. Good that was easy, right, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> again? Again? Okay. So, one foot in front, one foot behind. You pick up the arrow, you look at the, the colours. You want that odd colour towards you. You hear the click, like that. One finger on top, two below. Arm out straight, pull back, touch your cheek. Whoa. Wow. Just wow. like that. Okay? And you walk along and make sure they got it all set up as well? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So when I finish shooting, I come back and stand behind that line so that I know you're done. Okay? Okay. And then that when I tell you to go get the arrows, then everyone will go together. Yeah. Okay? So no one gets shot. 
Very important to know that when you walk towards the target, you don't walk directly to it. You walk along the sides, okay? Because it's hard to see the arrows. And when you pull the arrows, you want to pull them with two hands. One flat on the target, like that. And the second hand to pull it out. We just try not to bend them. Everyone's standing in front of their bows. I'm just going to give you all arrows, and then we'll be ready to shoot. Okay? You're, you're doing that one, aren't you? No, no, that's free. Oh, Anyone it? can jump on that one. Yeah. This is one of your archery. <laughs> to shoot. So everyone can pick up their bow and pick up the arrow. Yes. Put your hand up a bit higher, Bonnie. In, in inside of that grip. Put your hand up higher. Your other hand up right. Yep, right up in there. That's it. Twist your hand around towards me. Now you can close both and just wish you get it, not yet. I can wing Do you have like a left hand? Oh, that's okay. Is mine as well? Yes, yours is as well. Bradley camera, are you watching camera? Okay, oh. Are you shooting it? Yeah, I'll take photo of you. Oh, you're ready. Okay. Is this okay like this? Clarity. This is why I can. Okay. 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 Camera, I didn't even get the thing. I got the yellow one. Oh my goodness. Tiny? Oh, I didn't even make it. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't even make it. Oh, I made it to the grass. Oh, I made it to the grass. Oh, I made it to the target. I made it to the grass, camera. This is better. Better than this. 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 That was definitely not me that put it on there. That's mine sticking out of the grass. Wait, then mine went on the thing. Wow, I got it on the thing. Up you go, Bunny. Another one. I think I got mine in. I'm not sure. Hang on. Oh. Oh, I can't even make it to the target. <laughs> so, mine keeps hitting the it grass. Went, it went up to the black fence. For the first two, I wasn't Quite holding hard. the arrow right with two fingers in the one. Another one, Bunny. It went, it went, it went to the black fence. 
Oh, that's what I did last time I did it. I've only had one go at this before. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Huh? Don't, 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 don't go out. Don't go out yet. What am I doing? Camera, you watch this. And this is hard. Right, yeah. Yeah. Between here. People do anything. Click like in. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I almost made it to the top. It is a bit tricky. Pull it out, pull it out. Hang on. Pull out more, out more. Oh, Point oh, down oh. a little bit. Point down. Uh -huh. Pull out a little bit more and then shoot. Woo! Yay, you got it. I'm here. Are you getting my All right, do another one. Mm -hmm. I'm happy I got it in. Yeah. Hello, I'm over here. Yeah, I'm, I recorded this on your shoot. All right. Pull more. More, a little bit more. Yep, shoot. Oh, I missed that. That's not bad. Yep. And then it goes in. Let the bow go and it goes in. It's like a miracle. Yep, the white bit outside, good. So, so you do it like this? Yeah, I'm taking that. Right, pull out more. Point, point down a little bit. Yep, shoot. Oh, that oh, was fell close. Up. Not bad. I got one. Now, because we live in what they call a Mediterranean climate, very hot, dry summer, a cool, moist winter, most of our rainfall coming over the cooler months of the year, around May or June, up to around uh, September, October, but generally outside of that period, very little meaningful rainfall in the southwest. Because of that rainfall pattern, it causes what I see as three phases on the estuary every year. Now, just starting with winter, calling that phase one, that's when we get most of our rainfall. So most years we have a fair bit of water coming down from the catchment, down through the river system, into the estuary here. But it usually just passes straight out to sea. What happens on the coast here, through that period, starting a little earlier, around April or May, so the sand gets denuded or scoured off the beaches. And that's caused by the way the swell patterns and the currents out in the ocean work through that period. So you actually start getting a bit of a natural weakening and thinning of the sandbar just before we start getting our winter rains. And they do come with the associated flow. It rapidly causes the river to breach and cut a channel through the sandbar. And that's quite spectacular in its initial stages. So when the sandbar first opens, the water levels on the estuary can drop around two, two and a half, nearly three metres in the matter of around four or five hours. So it's like a huge rapid or horizontal waterfall that goes racing out into the ocean. The big brown stain or plume that goes out. Sometimes that can go out two or three kilometres, almost the outer reef lines. But as those rains continue to fall through those cooler months, with the natural weakening of the sandbar, will often hold the channel out for long periods. So usually through winter, the waters are a good metre or more lower than what they are now, with the five dirty sediment laden water flowing out into the ocean. <coughs> now, as we move into spring, we move into phase two. And during that period, the opposite effect happens with the sand begins to get deposited back onto the beaches. So there's a change in the swell patterns and the currents out in the ocean, the sandbar starts building up again. The easing of the flow, as our rain begins to dry up, it fills the channel in and dams it off. And then the water starts to rise behind the sandbar. It rises quite quickly initially. So a fair amount of water coming down. I can't hold it back for longer than a week or two, building up a metre or more, it opens up again. The water flows out once more. But usually, within a few days to a week, it'll close back up and start building up again. For another week or two, it'll open again, and close again. And open and close and open and close and open and close and open and close and open and close. Maybe even open and close once more. So through spring and early summer, what I call phase two, it's like it can't make its mind up. It's constantly opening and closing. By the time we get to mid-December and mid-January, we move into phase three. It does get very hot then. And by that time of year, there's virtually no water coming down from the catchment. Our rainfall's dried up. No meaningful rainfall in the southwest for the next five or six, sometimes seven months or more. Upstream, the river will just dry up a few water holes with barely even a trickle in between. And the sandbar will have built up sufficiently high enough and wide enough, similar to what we see to the northern or right hand side here, 
but it closes off most years at around Christmas time. And that will generally stay closed for the next four or five, sometimes six or seven months. Right up to around late May or June, perhaps even early July before we start getting your rains again. And then it just goes back to the beginning of the cycle. That's basically how it all works. And every year is a little bit different. Some years the rains come earlier, some years later, some years hardly at all. Is that a digital some years camera? the sandbar builds up higher and wider than other years. It really just depends on the prevailing conditions that year. But phase three, at Christmas, which is sometime after Easter, is an extremely important time of the estuary. Through that period there's lots of migratory birds in the area. A lot of the fish, macro and micro invertebrates are going through their breeding cycles. A very good feeding grounds for them in what I call the annually flooded wetland areas. And these are shallow, low-lying areas adjacent to the riverbanks, around the reed beds and the trunks of the paved parks that get flooded over that period. We've had a problem here in the past. The people often tend to try to dig the sandbar out. And what happens is when the sandbar closes off at Christmas, the water starts to rise. Over the next six to eight weeks, say by yeah, early to mid-February, you can often have a situation like today where we're now sitting at five or six feet higher than ocean level. There's an awful lot of pressure on that sandbar. You quite often get this very thin strip of sand, similar to what we see here to the left, it's right. slightly lower. That's where it's been opening recently. You see it's only about a foot high, probably a little wider when this boat is long. It actually holds the river back from the ocean. So literally all it takes sometimes is someone to drag their heels through the sand. Do the scratch for five minutes, start a little trickle. And within minutes, that trickle is this raging tiny, impossible to stop. People don't always realise the damage they cause when they dig it out. Because they dig it out in that view that's normally closed. It's the hottest, driest months of the year here in the southwest. The water levels are generally at their highest on the estuary. All they're doing is draining the water out of it, off of those low-lying areas. There's lots of habitat and many of the smaller creatures, the bases of the nature. Forced in the main river channel, it's like a vast barren open desert. Nowhere to hide, no protection from the larger predators, nowhere to lay their eggs. And the eggs are already laid in their shell and the land will dry out and expose the air. They'll die and they won't survive. I always say to people, please don't dig the sandbar. It causes far too much damage to the environment. Now, see, you see you, Mark. Hey, yeah. yeah. hey, yeah. we're going to get out of the window bit. We're going to have a look at some of the view of it. Basically, at this stage, when the start's up, we're going to put them all, that sandbar, place in the health of the estuary, and we not dig it out at all. Oh. Mm. Like I said, more about aspects of this, we go further up. I've got some solid drink here. River, well, Gilbert, as it's probably known, it's always been a fairly popular holiday and camping destination. The first Europeans thought they'd still have the sandbar back there and look up from the river mouth. Mm. A gentleman by the name of Norcott. This is back in 1831. Only around two years after the Squad River colony was first settled in 1829. Now, it wasn't about five years after he was here. About 1836, George Prince of came up this way. He was quite an interesting character. One of our earlier pre settlers. We got out here about 1830 or 31. So on the very first few boat loads. Oh, oh, boy. Boy. <laughs> 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 now, like, oh, they call him a pelican. But the beak holds as much as the pelican. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at that little bird. Big bird. Denise, look at that big bird. Oh. I got her in. So being an ambitious Woo. young man like me those times, out in his new colony, hoping to earn himself a fortune. If he didn't want to stay, eventually he may go back and relatively rich to retired gentleman. Now he carries to come in, he was granted 800 acres of land, free of charge in the Swan Valley. This north of Prince A. Midland. The property is called Millinger. It had another 12,000 acres partially out around the north of Fiji. Back in those early days, that was just wild bush.
here are some ducks swimming and looking for me. Are you coming to me, duckling? <laughs> Do you think I'm your friend? Ooh, I think I'm your friend. <laughs> quack, quack, quack. I think you thought Cam was coming, but he didn't come, did he? No, he didn't. This is the boat that we came on, guys. And we're doing sandboarding in Lonely Moor River, but I'm getting carried away with chasing the ducks. We go up to the top of the hill and we come back down. Watch this. She's going down. This is my sandboard that I will use. This is the one for bigger people. Oh. Flies are not my friends today. I have the fly fry. And yeah, come and join me. I'm going up there. Wish me luck.